Aluminum is one of the most versatile and ubiquitous minerals on the planet. But does aluminum have a dark side? This is The People's Pharmacy with Terry and Joe Graydon. We all recognize aluminum when we see it in pots and pans and fancy suitcases. Aluminum has played a key role in the airline industry. But did you know you can also find aluminum in antacids, antiperspirants, processed food, and even tap water? What is the impact of aluminum on the human body? Is this mineral inert or does it have biological activity? Could aluminum have unexpected toxic effects? Coming up on the People's Pharmacy, questions and some answers about the safety of aluminum. First, this news. In the People's Pharmacy health headlines, the antibacterial compound triclosan may carry unsuspected risks. Triclosan is found in most over-the-counter antibacterial soaps, many toothpastes, and mouthwashes. It's also found in some deodorants, toys, and trash bags. In the past, concerns have been raised that triclosan may have endocrine-disrupting properties. Now researchers report that this antibacterial chemical can disrupt muscle cells in mice and fish at levels comparable to human exposures. In the mice, heart rate dropped about 25% after exposure, while minnows exposed to triclosan in their water were less efficient swimmers. The researchers conclude, we have shown that triclosan potently impairs muscle functions by interfering with signaling between two proteins that are of fundamental importance to life. They suggest that regulatory agencies may want to reconsider the safety of this nearly ubiquitous compound. The lowly aspirin tablet has once again been shown to lower the likelihood of developing cancer. A number of studies have hinted that aspirin may have anti-cancer potential, but the benefit was not the same in every study. In a new analysis, health records of more than 100,000 American adults were examined for 10 years. When first recruited to the Cancer Prevention Study II Nutrition Cohort, these seniors filled out detailed questionnaires that included their history of aspirin use. They also responded to questions every two years throughout the study. The scientists found that those who took aspirin daily lowered their risk of digestive tract cancers by 40%. Doctors caution, however, that taking aspirin can increase the possibility of dangerous gastrointestinal bleeding and that it should not be undertaken without medical supervision. A commonly prescribed diabetes drug called Actos has been linked with an increased risk of bladder cancer. A year ago, the Food and Drug Administration issued a warning that this drug might raise a person's chance of developing bladder cancer. Now researchers have found data that confirms this concern. The investigators reviewed records from more than 60,000 people with type 2 diabetes in the United Kingdom. Those who took Actos were two to three times more likely to be diagnosed with bladder cancer compared to those taking other anti-diabetes drugs. Although the drug has been banned in France and Germany, it remains a popular treatment in the United States. Spanish researchers have found that a Mediterranean diet containing lots of virgin olive oil may be good for bones as well as the heart. For the study, more than 100 older men were randomly assigned to follow a heart-healthy diet for two years. One-third were given a low-fat diet plan, one-third followed a Mediterranean diet with mixed nuts, and the final third ate a Mediterranean diet that got most of its fat from olive oil. At the end of two years, the scientists found that blood levels of a compound called osteocalcin associated with bone formation had increased among the men assigned to the diet enriched with olive oil. How common is celiac disease? At one time, medical students were taught that only one person in 5,000 had this condition, in which a reaction to gluten damages the intestinal lining. Gluten, a protein in wheat, barley, and rye, can trigger nonspecific symptoms such as joint pain, anemia, or fatigue in susceptible people. A survey of 7,800 Americans used blood tests to find that 35 of these had celiac disease. That works out to a rate of 1 in 100 Caucasians. The majority of them were unaware that they were sensitive to gluten. The treatment for celiac disease is to avoid gluten in the diet. Older people may benefit from an ancient Mayan beverage with a modern twist. Older people with mild memory problems were randomized to receive a daily cocoa drink. 
30 of them were given cocoa rich in antioxidant flavanols. Another 30 got cocoa with intermediate levels of flavanols, and the remaining 30 got drinks with low levels of flavanols. The volunteers underwent cognitive testing at the beginning of the study and after two months. Those who had drunk high flavanol cocoa daily improved their tests of attention and mental skills. This study confirms previous research suggesting that cocoa flavanols are good for the brain. And that's the health news from the People's Pharmacy this week. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy. I'm Terry Graydon. And I'm Joe Graydon. We love aluminum because it's light and strong and has so many practical uses. We use it to purify water, relieve heartburn, and prevent underarm odor. But are there unexpected consequences from our love affair with aluminum? To find out, we turn to Chris Exley, Professor of Bioinorganic Chemistry at the Birchall Center of Leonard Jones Laboratories at Keele University in Staffordshire, UK. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy, Professor Exley. Hello. Dr. Exley, can you tell us a little bit about the Camelford water poisoning incident? We understand this happened, what, more than two decades ago? Yes, that's right. In 1988, a delivery of aluminium sulfate, which is used in water treatment, was made to an unmanned water treatment works close to a small town in Cornwall, England called Camelford. And the delivery should have been put into a secure tank where the aluminium sulfate could then be used to treat and purify the water. But the delivery driver, by mistake, put the aluminium sulfate directly or into a, into a contact tank, which was directly in line with the potable water supply. So what actually happened was that 20 tons of aluminium sulfate went directly into the drinking water supply of around 20,000 people in, in Camelford in Cornwall. And normally they wouldn't have that um, compound, that aluminum sulfate, right in their water, would they? Well, they, it's used to clean water, probably also in the U.S., but certainly here. Yes, it is. And after the cleaning process, there should be, a re there's always a residual amount of aluminum, but it would be the order of less than 0.2 milligrams per liter as a concentration. After this 20 tons of aluminium sulfate was put into the, the water supply of the Camelford residence, we are talking about concentrations in excess of 1,000 milligrams per litre, so at, at least 5,000 times higher than would normally be present. Well, tell us, is this compound poisonous? Were people poisoned? Well, first of all, this concentration of aluminium in the potable water supply causes all sorts of associated problems. And people actually started to notice problems with the water supply you know, within hours of this happening. I mean, there were some really quite bizarre things going on. So people knew there was a problem. Some people continue to try to use it and drink it. The, the unfortunate thing that happened was that the people were not informed of the nature of this problem. In fact, in, neither immediately nor indeed were they informed. I think it took three or four days before they were actually informed about it. And so they were told to do things like boil the water, which, of course, with respect to having aluminium in the water, means that all you would do would be to concentrate the aluminium. They were told to do things like, well, if it's got a bad taste, which indefinitely did, try taking the water with orange juice or something like that. Now, orange juice contains a compound called citric acid, 
which is known to increase the absorption of aluminium across your stomach or across your gut. So again, this was very poor advice. So in the first few days, yes, people had all sorts of short-term illnesses, some of which would have been attributed to the aluminium. Others could have been attributed to things like high levels of copper coming off the pipes. There may even have been some lead and other metals like zinc. So, Dr. Exley, what were the long-term consequences of this disaster? I think one could, could say that it was. And in particular, can you tell us about a woman by the name of Mrs. Cross and why her story has made headlines recently? Yeah, of course. Well, uh, the first thing to note, really, is that while one would have expected after an incident of this sort that there would have been some sort of extensive health monitoring program went on. Nothing of that sort went on whatsoever. And indeed, if one wanted to think about it in any other way, it even looks like it was purposely ignored. A cover-up. Well, yeah, that's what it's been called, and I'm pretty sure that's probably what, what happened. In other words, they did not want to highlight this as an issue. And... This was actually the case for many years, and even though people made some complaints in different ways, uh, many of these complaints were not taken seriously, and they certainly weren't followed up. So for you know, the first almost, well, 15, 16 years since the incident, there was actually almost no evidence, any strong evidence that was followed up of any health problems. However, in about 2004, so we're talking 16 years later, I was contacted by someone, um, a fellow called Douglas Cross, who had lived in Camelford during this incident because his wife had died very suddenly of what he, had be, he was told was an unknown neurological condition. And he wasn't happy with that as the reason for his wife's death. That he wanted myself, he knew about my expertise in aluminium, to see if we could organize some sort of neuropathology of his wife's brain post-mortem. And I contacted a world-famous neuropathologist in the field of, of Alzheimer's disease and other cognitive diseases known as Professor Margaret Asiri at Oxford University. And I asked her if she would be prepared to actually do the neuropathology, which is to look at Mrs. Cross's brain and determine that if there was any disease there. And when she did that, she found that Mrs. Cross had a very unusual form of a type of Alzheimer's disease known, known as chondrophilic amyloid angiopathy, abbreviated as CAA. So when that diagnosis was made, at the same time, brain samples were sent to myself. Some of those were from Mrs. Cross and the selection of others were from other brain banks with no actual relevance to this, uh, this incident. So that I could then analyze a series of brain samples blind, not knowing which was which, to see whether any of them had any aluminum in them or not. So we did that at Keele and actually one of those samples had a very, very high level of aluminum, very high, and that was actually the case of Mrs. Cross. So we had a situation with a very unusual form of Alzheimer's disease with a very high level of aluminium. Now, this essentially set off a coroner's inquiry into the death of Mrs. Cross. What did they find? What did they find? Well, after much evidence from a number of different parties, the coroner's verdict was along the lines of the aluminium in Mrs. Cross's brain and by analogy also her exposure to aluminium during the Camelford incident was likely to have been a contributor if not a cause of her death but he could not be any more conclusive than that because this is a single case so it looks very strongly that Mrs Cross's exposure to aluminium during the Camelford incident contributed to or caused her death by this very rare form of Alzheimer's disease. Professor Exley, our listeners are probably going, well, why are they going on and on about this one case in this one little town in the United Kingdom 
where there was this obvious accident. Was anybody else affected, A? And B, what does this have to do with the rest of us? Yeah, it's a great question. And most of us would have assumed, of course, that there many of the possible cases would have been looked at and would have come to some sort of, some sort of conclusions about other possible aluminium-related diseases in that population. Actually, Mrs. Cross's case was the first one that was ever looked at. So we've only really looked at one case of someone from Camelford who died of a condition which might be related to aluminium, and we found that there was a relationship. And again, this is probably because <laughs> the government preferred that we did not look into this. So this was a really serendipitous event in many ways that this particular person actually insisted that his wife's brain was looked at and by people who knew what they were doing and could do everything in, in a way which was acceptable both scientifically and, of course, as we've shown now in law as well. The question that comes from this is whether or not the case of Mrs. Cross is simply a one-off or whether one might have ex expect other cases either to have been an, and have gone unnoticed, or whether there could be other cases. It's very difficult to say. One thing, I mean, her the type of disease that she had was inexplicable for someone of her age. That type of disease would have been possible in someone in their 80s, maybe older, but not someone in their 50s. Our interpretation of this was that the, the main contribution of aluminium could well have been to bring on an earlier onset of the disease and to produce a more aggressive form of the disease. Now, what this possibly means is that there are other latent forms of this disease within the Camelford population or indeed people who were there and then moved away and are somewhere else now. And that we would very much like the opportunity to try to find out whether this is the case or not, because we do believe that there is a possibility that people could still be protected from this possible outcome if we were to find out now that they had, for example, more aluminium in their body than we would expect. You're listening to Chris Exley. He's professor of bioinorganic chemistry at the Birchall Center of Leonard Jones Laboratories at Keele University in Staffordshire in the United Kingdom. We need to take a short break. When we come back, we'll find out how we could minimize our aluminum exposure and protect ourselves with something you can pick up at any grocery store. We'll also get an overview of the possible connection between aluminum and Alzheimer's disease. And we'll talk with Dr. Chris McGrath about his analysis linking aluminum and antiperspirants to the risk of breast cancer. You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon.
Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. The People's Pharmacy is made possible by Red X Industries, makers of Utter Cream and Utterly Smooth Extra Care Cream, enriched with urea to moisturize dry, cracked skin. 800-345-7339. The website is uttercream.com. And by Ocean Nasal Care Products, offering easier breathing for people suffering from allergies, sinusitis, a cold, or the flu. Online at OceanNasalCare.com. If you would like to order a CD of this show, you can call 800-732-2334. This is show number 869. That number again, 800 732 2334 or you can find it on our website peoplespharmacy.com Today on the People's Pharmacy we're talking about the safety of aluminum. Our guest is Professor Chris Exley. He teaches bioinorganic chemistry at the Birchall Center of Leonard Jones Laboratories at Keele University in Staffordshire, UK. Professor Exley, as we were talking a few minutes ago, you mentioned one possible way we might protect ourselves. Could you please tell us more about that? Well, see, one of the research programs we have ongoing here, we have a, a program called Human Exposure to Aluminium. And one of the things we're trying to do is come up with a non-invasive method to remove aluminium from the human body both remove it and also reduce the uptake of aluminium across the gut, across the stomach. And we have actually come up with what looks like a very promising, you could even call it a therapy. And it's very simple. And it sort of relates to the main area of, of my own research, which is the, an interaction between the two elements, aluminium and silicon. And what we've found is that if you drink a silicon-rich mineral water, uh, examples in the States would be things like Fiji water, I think. Uh, do you have Volvic over there? I'm not sure. Uh -huh. uh, these, these are silicon rich. They have more than 30 milligrams per liter silica in the mineral water. If you drink that, you produce aluminium in your urine. In other words, it helps to remove aluminium from the body. We've shown this for the first time in actually in people with Alzheimer's disease. And we published this back in 2006. And we now have an ongoing study looking at healthy individuals, a fuller study on people with Alzheimer's. We're looking at people with Parkinson's disease. And the overall aim is if we can reduce what we call the body burden of aluminium, how much aluminium there is in your body, down to a, essentially a practical minimum, then if aluminium plays any role in diseases such as Alzheimer's, or indeed in the case like of Mrs. Cross of this form of Alzheimer's, then we should be able to prevent it. Well, you, you have been referred to as the aluminium man in the UK, and you have just opened a can of worms, Professor Exley, because the issue of aluminum, as we pronounce it here in the States, and Alzheimer's disease has been controversial for decades. Can you kind of give us an overview of your perspective and what are the potential risks? Well, for the last hundred years, we've been living in the aluminum or aluminium age. It is the most wonderful metal. It has changed our lives in so many different ways. We cannot avoid coming into contact with it. I often say to people that every cell in your body has at least one aluminium atom in there. Now, the sort of assumption has always been, and where this assumption came from, one can only guess, but probably the aluminium industry, that aluminium is this benign, uh, non-reactive metal. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. And, you know, we do know that where that exposure can be overt, where you can get high-level exposure, we know that aluminium is neurotoxic. We know that aluminium can cause bone disease, but these are highly unusual circumstances. So the bigger question is whether or what is the consequence of a slow but sure increase in your body burden of aluminium, bearing in mind that every aluminium atom will participate in some form of biochemistry, and that biochemistry your body doesn't want or need. You know, aluminium, because it's so biologically reactive, in theory, there are very few systems where it 
could not produce some sort of biochemical or biological response. But what you're mostly interested in asking is where, bearing in mind that you probably need a threshold level of aluminium to be reached before you produce any sort of, let's call it toxicity, then you need, for example, a cell type or something where aluminium can accumulate. Now, the neuron in the brain is the perfect target for aluminium because your neurons exist for much of your life. In other words, they're they're the most long-lived cells in the body. And therefore, they have this unique capability of accumulating aluminium over a lifetime, potentially bringing towards a threshold, which could be, you know, in your fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth decade, at which point it could start to trigger possible, uh, in in the case of a neuro, neurotoxic effects. The same is also true in bone, and that's why potentially bone is another known target. Uh, Professor Exley, we are exposed to aluminum from the time we are born until the time we die from a variety of sources. I, I wonder if you could run through them, because the ones that come to my mind are things like antacids that many of us uh, can buy over the counter. We've already mentioned antiperspirants. But things like tea, I think Americans are astonished when they learn that tea is actually a source of, of uh, aluminium. Yeah. But the heating elements in our coffee makers are often, um, they contain an aluminum heating element, and that heating element may also allow aluminum to get into the water. So can you run through the whole gamut of exposure to aluminum? I don't think I can do the whole gamut. It will be, we'll be here for quite, quite, quite a long time, as I said, because we live in this thing called the aluminium age. I mean, wherever you're talking about diet, then aluminium is, is used in processing, in food processing. And so you will find it in a huge number of processed foods. Things like a processed cheese, where, you, where the cheese is perfectly smooth. And it's perfectly smooth because they use aluminium to actually cover the surfaces of the cheese particles to stop them aggregating and forming clumps. And this process, actually, where where aluminium is sometimes described as an anti-caking type agent, is used in many, many different products in in that way. It is also present, I mean, for example, we we just finished a piece of work that was published back in now 2010, looking at the aluminium content of infant formulas. So these are the breast milk substitutes that people use and often have to use as a substitute for breast milk for infants. And again, we are astounded at the amount of aluminium that is in these products. But when one tries to find out why it is there, it's almost impossible. And some of the assumptions one can make is that actually simply the use of aluminium processing equipment must contaminate things to a certain extent. I mean, a real travesty is that there is no legislation for aluminium in any form. In other words, you can have as much aluminium in any product, whether it be a food, whether it be a medicine, whatever it is, there's absolutely no legislation to in any way protect us from it. And that is, you know, that, that, that really is something which should not be sustainable, but it is. Professor Exley, until we have the answers, uh, until we know whether or not aluminum is safe, are you making any recommendations or changing your own behavior or the behavior of your friends and family? In other words, what do you advise people until the final word is in? Yeah, I mean, there is something that most of us understand now is the precautionary principle. And yes, we should adopt it. So while I, while I told you that I use an, an, an aluminium-based antiperspirant, it is one of the very few concessions that I make, and I make it because you know, I'm a, I cycle to work every day and you know, these things are important to me that I'm a relatively fresh and not, not poor, badly smelling individual in my office. But taking that to one side, I make a point and my family makes a point of not eating any processed foods or drinks. Um, we also drink silicon-rich mineral waters to help us, we hope, to reduce our body burden of aluminium. So the precautionary principle. I don't think anyone should stop doing something which is an important part of their life at this stage simply because of a worry about aluminium. 
because I, I, and I'm not one to be responsible for that because I don't have all the evidence yet. But if you can avoid exposure to aluminium in any particular way, then you should do because it has no benefit to you. And in fact, in the, where aluminium is beneficial, you know, in other words, it is providing a particular function or a service to us, then we should continue to use it. But there's a many, many instances where it's simply there for no reason at all. You know, it's simply used because it's the cheapest thing. You know, it's a very, very cheap product by comparison to others. So you've mentioned processed foods. Mm. What about tea? And what about those coffee makers that we're so fond of? Yeah, I mean, the tea story is an interesting one. Obviously, one of the reasons why tea contains a lot of aluminium is that it's grown in areas where the aluminium is available in the soil. And tea has, uh, and one of the reasons why tea produces beautiful <laughs> beautiful cups of tea is they've got these things called catechols in there, these types of organic acids. And these organic acids are what bind the aluminium up in the tea leaves. So that when we make our tea out of it, some of them come out. So yes, tea contains a lot of aluminium. What we're not quite so sure about is what the proportion of the aluminium in tea gets across the gut. A while ago, I would say 20 years ago, the suggestion was that aluminium in tea did not, it was not easily absorbed across the gut. Actually, some of the research we've been doing and others previously is suggesting otherwise. Yes, and things like, I mean, coffee, not to mention your coffee maker, yes, but coffee itself is also a product which tends to accumulate aluminium. So even coffee has aluminium in it. And listen, tea and coffee are always in my office. So these are things that I don't make an attempt to avoid. But if you're asking, could they contribute to an exposure to aluminium? Yes, they could. My philosophy is that aluminium is here to stay. Aluminium, in general, has been a good thing for us. So what we need to do is learn to live with it safely and effectively. That is why, for example, we're pursuing with our silicon-rich mineral water strategy, because it seems to us that it should be possible to live safely and effectively with aluminium in the aluminium age without causing stock markets to crash and everyone wanting to essentially get rid of aluminium we should be able to live with it. We should be able to include something within our lifestyle, which means that we can almost automatically protect ourselves against the possibility of its toxicity. But we need to do this research, and we also need to begin. Someone needs to start accepting that aluminium is toxic. Professor Exley, thank you so much for talking with us on The People's Pharmacy today. My pleasure. You've been listening to Chris Exley, Professor of Bioinorganic Chemistry at the Birchall Center of Leonard Jones Laboratories at Keele University in Staffordshire, UK. You can hear more of our extended interview with Dr. Exley at peoplespharmacy.com. We turn now to Dr. Chris McGrath, Professor in Medicine, Allergy, and Immunology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Dr. McGrath, you got interested in aluminum some time ago. Why was that? I got interested in aluminum after my first wife uh, died of breast cancer, uh, followed by my mother dying of breast cancer, followed by my first wife's uh, mother dying of breast cancer. And um, I noticed there was an increased incidence of breast cancer. It's a hormone-driven disease, and uh, I was just trying to look for where the excess hormones were coming from. I was concerned about my first wife with her frequent shaving application of antiperspirants once or twice a day. And then um, I surveyed uh, breast cancer survivors through the tumor registry at uh, St. Joseph Hospital in Chicago and found that the uh, more women, these women, shaved their underarms and the more they applied uh, antiperspirants, the earlier age of breast cancer diagnosis they had and that in those individuals that started before 16 versus after 16, they also had an earlier age of diagnosis of breast cancer. What had led you to uh, think about aluminum? Because certainly there are a lot of factors that people might finger as a potential um, factor involved in breast cancer. 
Yeah, there's a lot of known uh, risk factors for breast cancer from diet, uh, exercise, uh, exogenous hormone replacement uh, therapy. So it's just not one risk factor. I'm just considering it as a potential risk factor or an augmented uh, risk factor. Dr. McGrath, you know, most people don't think very much about aluminum. Uh, it's, you know, one of those miracles of, of modern life. Uh, it, it helps in construction and our vehicles. I mean, we, you know, aluminum is everywhere. Most people don't think that they're actually using it on a daily basis. But as you pointed out, antiperspirants almost always contain aluminum in one form or another. Why do you consider that a potential problem? You, you have written about it in the medical literature uh, in the journal Medical Hypotheses. Tell us about that. Well, aluminum in antiperspirants is in the form of aluminum salts. It's different than that in aluminum, such as used in automobile production or cooking utensils. So uh, it has a, an opportunity to free itself from its binding. And the aluminum anion is very small. It can penetrate uh, into cells, into the nucleus of cells, and in some plant studies. Uh, it's been shown to alter um, DNA and RNA, and when you alter or change the way DNA and RNA work, that's how uh, cancer can develop. And that was my working hypothesis. You're listening to Dr. Chris McGrath. He's professor in medicine, allergy, and immunology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. And we'd like to remind you that what Dr. McGrath is talking about is really a, a hypothesis. It's, it's actually almost just a speculation designed to get people thinking about something in a way they might not have thought about it before. Well, it was actually published. Dr. McGrath's uh, original hypothesis was published in a journal called Medical Hypotheses. And as you point out, is to get people thinking and maybe to stimulate further research. Uh, there, there are a lot of questions about aluminum and I think a lot of the issues around Alzheimer's disease are also medical hypotheses. We, we don't have a smoking gun. That's right. And we always need to remember that uh, association is not causation. We'll need to be looking at uh, some actual experimental data as well as some epidemiology at some point in the future. We need to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to continue our discussion with Dr. McGrath about the incidence of breast and prostate cancer in countries with the highest use of antiperspirants. He offers his advice to listeners on ways that we can be more aware of our exposures to chemicals that we put on our skin. Then we'll talk with Dr. Philippa Daub about her research into the levels of aluminum in breast tissue. She's found higher concentrations of aluminum in the part of the breast closer to the armpit. This, these are in breast cancer patients. She'll also explain how aluminum could be an endocrine disruptor. You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon.
Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Red X Industries, makers of utterly smooth foot cream with shea butter, helping dry cracked feet feel soft and smooth. 800-345-7339. The website is uttercream.com. And by Blue Lizard Australian Sun Cream, providing high protection against both UVA and UVB sun exposure. Blue Lizard Sensitive is fragrance and paraben-free with zinc oxide for delicate skin. The number is 800-334-4286 on the web at bluelizard.net. If you'd like to order a CD of today's show or any other People's Pharmacy broadcast, you can call 800-732-2334. Today's show is number 869. That number again. 800-732-2334 800-732-2334 or you can find it online at peoplespharmacy.com. Today on the People's Pharmacy we're talking about aluminum and the possibility that some aluminum containing products might be doing us harm. Our guest is Dr. Chris McGrath. He's professor in medicine, allergy, and immunology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. He's been suggesting that there's a link between aluminum antiperspirants and certain cancers. Now, of course, epidemiologists would say association does not equal causation. And so at this point, it's merely a medical hypothesis. But what makes you concerned? Well, I also notice in both my papers, I plot the incidence of breast cancer. And in my second paper, another hormone-driven cancer, prostate cancer, I plot them against the sales of um, antiperspirants in a variety of countries. And I know correlation is not causation, but um, as the usage of antiperspirants um, increases, so does the uh, incidence of breast and prostate cancer in those countries in my papers. So far, this is a hypothesis. Is there any data to suggest that aluminum might actually have an impact on breast tissue? There's no direct link of aluminum to breast tissue. There is a study by Dr. Uh, Philippa Darbray in England, and she has shown uh, that aluminum is present in breast tissue and in breast cancer uh, tissue. But she can't directly link it to causing cancer. Tell us a little bit more about her research, please. She's concerned about cosmetics applied to the skin, uh, especially the underarm and um, how the most common breast cancer is closest to the underarm and the upper outer quadrant, and it's usually more left breast than right breast because there's more right-handed people than left-handed people. So she's put together these um, anecdotal and coincidental observations, more funding, and, uh, yet um, requires more research, which requires more funding, and funding for this research is uh, hard, 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 hard to hard come to, by, perhaps. Yes, it's hard to come by. So if we don't have a lot of research yet, and the FDA isn't paying too much attention yet, if you were to uh, give advice to someone, a woman who came to you and said, gee, Dr. McGrath, your hypothesis has me concerned. What should I do to protect myself? What should she do? Well, I like to speak for individuals. I just recommend what I do, and I prefer a deodorant over an antiperspirant. Deodorants reduce odor. Bathing reduces odor. I'm just afraid of altering uh, the underarm, which some in some literature it's considered an organ. Like you wouldn't want to risk other organs, such as your kidney, your heart, your liver. So I usually recommend what I do and just avoid the aluminum salts. And you can find on the shelf just deodorants. Deodorants don't contain aluminum salts. Uh, their purpose is to reduce odor, and that's the main social goal of uh, antiperspirants and deodorants. Antiperspirants uh, reduce sweat with little effect on odor. What's the message that you would like our listeners to take home today with regard to uh, antiperspirants? This is a product that almost everybody uses almost every day. You'll find it in virtually every medicine chest in, the, in America. What would you like people to take away? 
I think you should be aware of what you put on, on your skin. The skin is the largest organ of the body, over 5 trillion cells, and we put lots of things on our, our skin from uh, shampoo, hair conditioner, lipstick, makeup, antiperspirants. I don't think we should solely just focus on uh, antiperspirants. I think you should be aware, aware of putting different chemicals and substances on your skin. That's the message I like people to take away is be aware of what you do to your body. Dr. Chris McGrath, we want to thank you very much for talking with us today on The People's Pharmacy. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to Dr. Chris McGrath, Professor in Medicine, Allergy, and Immunology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. You can find an extended interview with Dr. McGrath in which he explains his hormone hypothesis. That's at peoplespharmacy.com. We turn now to Dr. Philippa Daub. She's a reader in oncology in the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Reading in England. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy, Dr. Daub. Thank you very much. We have been following your research for quite a long time, and I have to say you've created quite a stir here in the States, uh, in large measure because when people hear about antiperspirants or personal care cosmetic products, they just assume by definition they are absolutely safe. The Food and Drug Administration wouldn't permit them on the market unless they were. And yet you have kind of upset the apple cart. Can you tell us a little bit about your research and what you have been investigating for the last several years? Yes, I, well, my research goes back about, about 30 years looking at the role of estrogen action in breast cancer. And I think I became interested first when I started to learn about all the uh, pesticides and PCBs and pollutants that could get into the human diet through animal fat and get into uh, breast tissue. And I started to become concerned about uh, such chemicals. And then it came to my attention that there might also be such chemicals in cosmetics, which are applied under the arm and around the breast region. And so I started to look into what was in these cosmetics. And I think the other thing that, that fueled my interest was the fact that if you look at the incidence of breast cancer, it's not equally distributed across the breast. If you divide the breast into four quadrants and a central area, in the US as, as, and in the UK, we have more than half of breast cancers occurring in the upper outer quadrant of the breast, for which there seems to be no uh, real explanation. The current explanation is that there's more breast tissue in that region, a more target tissue for the cancer in that region. Uh, but uh, for my book, that doesn't explain it because in the in uh, early studies, we had about 30% of breast cancers in the upper outer quadrant in the uh, mid-1940s, 1950s, and now we have uh, a very large number, about 60% up in that region. So the amount's going up, and I don't think my breast tissue is migrating. Of course, the other explanation is that possibly that's where one's putting a lot of chemicals under the arm and around the breast every day, and maybe this is also impacting. So I guess one of my interests in the research was to find out, uh, as a scientist, what the mechanism of action of these chemicals alone and together might be, but also to find out whether they were getting into the human breast. And I think it was when, they, when we started measuring them in the human breast that that probably uh, caused the stir and uh, got people's uh, concerns up. Now, there's another compound that's found in antiperspirants quite widely in the U.S., and it's aluminum. Can you tell us why it's there and why you've also been studying that? Yes, I'm very concerned also about the aluminium. Aluminium is added as the active antiperspirant agent. So antiperspirant means that it actually stops the perspiration. So the aluminium salts are added, they get on the skin and they actually block the sweat ducts. So they form a physical plug at the top of the sweat ducts. My understanding is that this plug is sort of composed of uh, aluminium salts and dead cells, which sort of form this physical plug at the top of a, a sweat duct and then prevent, therefore, the sweat from getting out onto the body surface. So they do a very effective job. They basically stop the sweat getting out onto the skin surface. But I'm concerned because aluminium is toxic. We know it's toxic in its own right. Uh, there are studies in, in relation to Alzheimer's disease which show that small amounts of aluminium can be uh, problematic. And uh, we know that aluminium can get into the human breast. Aluminium is not a normal component of biological systems. 
So the fact that we find it in the breast tissue means it must be coming from outside. And obviously antiperspirants would be one logical source. They would. The aluminium, of course, like the parabens, is used in a variety of consumer products. And so aluminium can also be found in, in food and water and so on. But obviously the antiperspirant in terms of the breast is uh, quite a, a large exposure issue. The other thing is that these products do carry a warning, I think, most of them, saying that people should not shave before applying the chemicals. And I, my understanding is that many women and, and, and indeed men now do also shave first and then apply the chemicals. Well, shaving, of course, can damage the skin. So, of course, this can aid the chemicals in getting uh, the other side of the skin barrier. Is there any reason to believe that aluminum, and I'm going to persist in my American pronunciation, I welcome your <laughs> British pronunciation, uh, is there any reason to suspect that aluminum is involved in breast cancer? Well, at the moment, we're at a position of being able to measure aluminium in the human breast. Um, we've measured aluminium in breast tissue and breast fat. We've measured it in breast cyst fluid. Cysts are, are not cancer, but they are certainly problems in the breast that up, uh, upset women very much by finding a lump in the breast. And we've also measured, and this was in collaboration with a professor in Italy, Professor Manello, uh, measured levels in nipple aspirate fluids and found increased levels of aluminium in the nipple aspirate fluids from cancer patients compared to non-cancer patients, or at least patients who hadn't got cancer at the time of, of sampling. So aluminium is, is present in the breast. We know that uh, from the Alzheimer's literature that aluminium can have quite uh, toxic effects, including uh, effects on, on gene expression and, and the DNA, which is the sort of central issue in controlling cells. And um, we also know that aluminium now can mimic estrogen action and can act as a metalloestrogen. So there are various ways in which one might uh, have concern for aluminium in the human breast. But of course, no, no one has ever directly linked any one of these chemicals to the development of breast cancer. But I just heard you say that aluminum is an endocrine disruptor. It is. It is, a metal which is what we call a metalloestrogen. Most of the endocrine disruptors that have been studied are organic molecules that mimic uh, the action of the female hormone estrogen and so are organic. But some metal ions can also get into the estrogen receptor through which the female hormone works and mimic uh, the action of the, the hormone. Dr. Darb, hundreds of millions of Americans are using such products on a daily basis, perhaps even two or three times a day, and they probably aren't going to know what to make of what you're saying. Uh, we hear that in Europe there is a greater interest in something called the precautionary principle. Can you tell us what that is and how you would advise people to react to your research and to the uncertainty associated with some of these cosmetic ingredients? Yes, the, the precautionary principle is really one that, that says when there's a weight of evidence that one might uh, consider taking some, some action, even if something has not been definitively proved to cause a cancer, say breast cancer, but there's good evidence to suggest that it might be a problem in certain quantities in the breast, that it might be a good idea to take a precautionary action. I think with all things, if one has enough of them, they can become toxic. Even oxygen that we require for life can become toxic if we have too much of it. And the question, I think, with a lot of these cosmetics is, is also how much we use. I know that uh, various people have been interviewed in the media in the UK, and I remember very much one man who said that he used a whole can of antiperspirant every five days. I think that's probably an application every, every hour through the day. It must be an enormous amount of chemical. So there comes a point at which we have to ask how much of these things can we use as much as whether should we use them at all or not. I personally stopped using them, uh, the underarm cosmetics, in the uh, mid-1990s when I first started thinking about this because I didn't know why I put them under my arm every morning. And I'm no, no longer convinced that we need to use them. I wash with soap and water twice a day and no one's yet complained when they come into my office. <laughs> 
So that would be an alternative then to using antiperspirants? I think the the option is to cut down or cut out as much as one can, yes. So we just need to be a little more cautious, a little more thoughtful about uh, what we are putting in our armpits. I think that's right. I think we have to think about how much we use on a daily basis. And from our recent publication in 2012, I think we have to um, think not just about what goes under the arm, but other parts of the body, because in that particular study that we published in January this year, there were seven women in that study who told us that they had never used an underarm cosmetic. They didn't tell us anything about the other personal care products they might have used. We didn't have access to that information. But we know they'd never used an underarm cosmetic, and yet they still had parabens in their breast tissue, which made me rethink some of my own thought processes that actually these things may be coming more widely from cosmetics that are applied around the body. Dr. Darb, you have been very interested for a very long time in breast cancer in particular and the chemicals that are found in the human breast. And we have focused primarily on aluminum, as you say, aluminum, as well as the parabens. But there are probably dozens, if not hundreds, of other chemicals that women are exposed to. How concerned are you about some of those other products? I think those are all part of the equation and we can't forget that there are pesticides and PCBs coming in in dietary fat uh, and other things in the diet that we eat. There are also the plant uh, phytoestrogens that, that we consume and yes there are other things coming at us from the household environment as well and all these we know are getting into the human breast and yes I think we should be concerned about the overall cocktail that's getting into the human breast in the modern world. The thing about the cosmetics that has always appealed to me is that if there's anything in it at all, then it gives women the option individually to do something about it. If it's what we eat in our diet or the environment where we live, it's much more difficult to change that. We can, and it may be a good reason to be concerned about that, but it, it's a longer term a proposition to change that, whereas cosmetics, women can decide overnight to cease to use them if they so wish. So it gives women, if you like, some, some personal uh, decisions that they can take without uh, being influenced by uh, the environment around them. Dr. Philippa Daubre, thank you so much for talking with us on the People's Pharmacy today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Dr. Philippa Daubre, Reader in Oncology in the School of Biological, Biomedical, and Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Reading in Reading, England. Lynn Siegel produced today's show. Peter Bombar, Robin Copley, and Al Wodarski engineer the program. Dave Graydon edits our interviews. The People's Pharmacy is produced at the studios of North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. The People's Pharmacy theme music is by B.J. Lederman. The People's Pharmacy is made possible in part by Ocean Nasal Care Products. Offering easier breathing for people suffering from allergies, sinusitis, a cold, or the flu. Online at OceanNasalCare.com. And by Blue Lizard Australian Sun Cream, providing high protection against both UVA and UVB sun exposure. Blue Lizard Sensitive is fragrance and paraben-free with zinc oxide for delicate skin. The number 800-334-4286 on the web at BlueLizard.net. Next week on The People's Pharmacy, we talk with Dr. Otis Brawley, Chief Medical Officer of the American Cancer Society, about how we do harm in healthcare. To order today's show, you can call 800 732 2334. Today's show is number 869. That number 800 732 2334 on the web at peoplespharmacy.com. When you go to the website, you can share your thoughts about today's show or check out our People's Pharmacy books, guides, and products. You may also wish to sign up for our free online newsletter or subscribe to the free podcast of the show. In Durham, North Carolina, I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Thanks for listening. Please join us again next week.